What's up, everybody? Welcome to System Crafters. I'm David Wilson, and today we're back with another Friday uh, stream, the System Crafters Live series, where we just hang out as a community and talk about some interesting topics and uh, just, you know, have a good time chatting overall. Uh, so I, uh, let's see, let's see if we can welcome who's here today. Um, so let's see, TRDV, uh, Luis, uh, Thomas, or, or is it Thomas or Tomas? I think I maybe pronounced your name wrong. Uh, Silly Dragon, Piotr, uh, Marcin, Manuel, Hen, Steven, nice to see everybody here today. Let's see, uh, Silly Dragon says, I don't know if I'd call Gemini the hacker's web. Well, let's let's talk about it first, and then you can tell me whether you would disagree or not. I'm interested to hear your opinion on that. Hey, Jason, nice to have you here. Hey, Garjola, Alex. All right, let's see, let me bring up my screen. Hey, Simon, Antonio, Elephant454, gone. Let me uh, pull up the screen here. So you can see yourselves. One data O, Appenzell. Thanks everybody for being here today. So uh, before I go into the main topic of today's stream, uh, what I would like to point out is that, that we actually reached 10,000 subscribers this week. I think it happened on Monday or Tuesday, uh, but that's, I mean, it's not like a huge milestone or anything, but it is a milestone. Uh, it's pretty awesome that uh, we've hit that mark because it does mean that there are you know people interested in the channel and the and the content that we are uh, making here that I'm making here. Um, I'm trying to fix the volume a little bit, uh, and I'm just really thankful that that people are interested and and want to participate in the channel and in the live streams and in just the just Discord and everything. It's it's really awesome. It's really motivating and inspiring for me to at least you know hit such a sort of minorly significant number such as ten thousand. Um, but uh, yeah, let's see what happens whenever I hit 100,000. Uh, Benoit and some others were, were joking that I should do a 24-hour live stream. That's that's not going to happen. My, my life situation would not allow for me to do a 24-hour live stream. But uh, yeah, it's some, it's some bigger milestone in the future. We might do something special for that. Let's see. Hey, Matthew. Uh, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name. I don't know if it's Anton. Yeah, it's probably Anton, right? And uh, Mark. I'm not going to surpass Linus Media Group anytime ever, I don't think. I think that they, uh, they're they a little bit too huge. Go, do a cooking stream? Okay, I could cook something, but I, I don't think that's something people would want to see here. You know, let, see me burn some, uh, some pasta or something. Thank you very much, folks. Uh, let's see. Let's go on right to the next topic then. Uh, so... Today, what I wanted to talk about was something that I found to be pretty interesting. Uh, it's a protocol. I don't know how new it is. I think it's been around for maybe a year at least, uh, but it's still fairly unknown. You may have seen it discussed on various YouTube channels here. Um, uh, on, I think DistroTube did a video on it maybe a month or two ago. And uh, if, you, if you saw this morning, if you subscribed to Luke Smith, he did a video this morning that was kind of uh, on the opposite end of the spectrum, more like... Uh, uh, not trashing it, but sort of like yes, being skeptical of it in general. Um, so it's it's Gemini. The the basically it's an alternative to HTTP. So basically you have the modern web, which is HTTP, where you have all of these websites and web services and whatnot exposed to the HTTP protocol, and then you have you know modern browsers like you know Mozilla Firefox, Google Chrome, etc. that provide an interface to this, and much of the modern web is powered by. 
uh, sites using JavaScript. Uh, so, you know, websites are more like applications these days in that uh, a lot of times what you do is you go to a website and it downloads probably, you know, half a meg or more of uh, of assets and JavaScript files, etc. all so that it can just make uh, API requests to some server to get the content for the website. So the web isn't really the web anymore in the sense that you go to a page, you get the content of that page back, and then you navigate to another page. Uh, it's more like an application where you, like if you go to Twitter, basically you go to twitter.com and then it's just a big JavaScript application that's just making web requests the whole time. So um, Gemini is kind of an alternative to that. It kind of brings us back closer to the origins of the web uh, back in like the early 90s, where you uh, have a much simpler protocol and simpler representation of what pages are inside of that protocol. How many of you have heard about uh, Gemini so far? Or how, how many of you have actually like done anything with it? So uh, basically what I would say about Gemini is that it's focused on serving and linking information um, and not really like these distracting and power, hung power hungry JavaScript websites. Um, you don't see images on these pages. You don't see uh, custom fonts. You don't see a lot of other things that you would normally see in modern web pages. And that's actually a good thing. And I'll explain why that is. Silly Dragon says they have a Gemini site. That's cool. Uh, yeah, and uh, Brendan says that he's read about the protocol. That's good. Eric has a capsule. Yeah, I remember you talking about that in Discord. Steven's made a small capsule. <clears throat> uh, yeah, a lot of lot of great independent blogs on uh, on Gemini, as Elephant says. So yeah, some of you here are already uh, familiar with it, which is good because we're going to show a little bit more about that today. So um, basically, the Gemini fact, if you go to their their page, the frequently frequently asked questions page it describes it as the web but stripped back down to its essence or stripped right back to its essence if I want to get the, the quote correctly uh, basically it is a protocol that is meant to be simple and whenever I explain the protocol to you you'll see why I say that because it, it is very simple and there's a philosophy behind why it's simple uh, but let's just talk about why it's simple first or I guess what makes it simple uh, first of all there's limited markup so in HTML whenever you go to a normal website uh, on the World Wide Web through the HTTP protocol, um, HTML has quite a lot of things you can do with it. So there's lots of different types of elements in HTML that you can use to organize information and content on a page. And then there's uh, CSS, which is a whole other type of file format where you can apply styling to those HTML elements. I and mean, you can do some pretty elaborate things with that. And then there's uh, uh, JavaScript, which can also affect the markup of a page in real time dynamically while you are using the site itself. So um, Gemini doesn't allow any of that. It's just basic, basically very simple markup that's inspired by uh, Markdown. So there's no like XML tags. There's nothing like that. It's a line based protocol. And we'll uh, uh, talk about that a little bit more in a second. Uh, also, as I mentioned, there's no client side scripting, um, which means that it's a lot easier for a Gemini client to exist because it doesn't have to worry about implementing an entire JavaScript engine or some other scripting engine. Um, this is actually kind of nice, and I, we can explain why that is the case in a bit as well. Uh, no inline images, so you won't have a lot of images thrown about a web, web page. You basically have to click on links to go to images. That might seem annoying to you, but um, I think that for the purposes of what Gemini is used for, it actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, no custom fonts. So if you like to have a nice looking font on your blog, uh, you can basically forget about that with Gemini. But the, the, the benefit here is that the, the priority is put on the client itself and not on the site. So the site just gives you information and then the client can decide however they want to display it. So your client can have whatever font that it wants and, uh, and display the information however it wants, uh, however is most effective for the user. And really the, the site is just providing information that's used in the client. Let's see, uh, Mizu, sometimes it just eats the links. I don't even see them myself. Um, and uh, links are also uh, separate from the actual text. So you can't do like an embedded link, like right here where I have this uh, Gemini fact link inside of this line. You can't actually do that in Gemini markup. Um, and there's a reason for that also, which I'll explain later. And it's also not very extensible on purpose. Uh, basically, they're trying to make it so that there's no little loopholes that you can use to um, cause a Gemini client to do things that you don't want it to do for like tracking you or uh, invading your privacy somehow. So uh, I think that's a good feature. Um, obviously, it is um, 
debatable on whether that's useful for the mainstream internet. Um, so basically, this protocol, or this, yeah, this protocol is designed so that it's very easy to implement both clients and servers. Um, you'll see in just a second why that's the case. But uh, the, one of the goals for the project is that someone who has read the, the spec should be able to write a client comfortable for daily use in a single weekend by a single developer. So uh, basically, it's, it's easy enough that it's, it's fun not just for you know, making websites, but it's also cool if you want to just have a project that you can use to learn some new programming language and you want to write a client or a server for Gemini because it's actually quite straightforward. You don't have to worry about all kinds of crazy uh, specifications you have to follow. The actual specification for, for Gemini is probably two pages long, so maybe two or three pages. And it's it's very easy to follow. So uh, it's it's a good thing to, uh, to to check out if you are interested in some kind of cool project to work on. Uh, hey, Benoit, nice, nice that you were able to join us today. Let's see. Hey, Jerry. Hey, Ramses. Just checking in on who else is here. So someone asked about Gopher. So we're, I'm not going not gonna to talk about Gopher very much, but I will mention it because uh, Gopher was kind of an inspiration for Gemini. So uh, basically, Gopher was an early internet protocol for serving hypertext information. And if you know what HTML stands for, it's like the hypertext markup language. Uh, hypertext basically just means uh, documents that have links to other documents. That's a very simplistic way to put it, but if someone has a better descript description, pl please feel free to, to say it in the chat. Um, and they, they have this information organized in a hierarchical, hierarchical fashion. The, the difference between that and the, the web, like HTTP, is that HTTP is meant to be more decentralized, where you have different websites that have information, and Gopher is more hierarchical somehow. I, I don't know a whole lot about Gopher, so uh, you'll have to forgive me on missing details on that. Uh, but basically, uh, Gemini takes inspiration from the Gopher protocol uh, in that the information is displayed in a simple form and uh, it depends on the client to be able to, to display the information in a way that is useful to the user. Um, however, Gemini takes inspiration from the modern web in a lot of ways and also modernizes its own protocol so that you can do things like have, have different text encodings for maybe, you know, different parts of the, the Unicode set or different, different character sets, etc. Uh, or different languages. Um, it also, uh, it uses TLS encryption by default for, for connections to servers. So there's no way to do an unencrypted connection to a, Go a Gemini server. I don't think that's the case with Gopher. So, um, it's, it's different, but it has similar, you know, core principles in that it should be simple and it should be very client driven where the client is the one that has more control over how the information is displayed. Uh, and it's, it's very information driven. It's not like a content driven thing like HTTP where you have, you know, videos and pictures and, you know, animated stuff on, on the page and whatnot. It's, it's very information driven. Let's see. Just checking the chat a little bit. Uh, Benoit says you can write a Gemini client with just, just bash. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Hey, Kateru. So um, what we're going to do right now is to actually check out what Gemini looks like in practice. Uh, we're going to use a Gemini client in Emacs called Elfer. And this is actually very easy to install um, because you can just use use package to install it. Uh, in fact, I should probably just drop the config in for that right here. Let me just see if I can pull this in, pull it in for my configuration. I don't think I did anything other than just, yeah, use package Elfer. So yeah, if you want to install this, it's super easy. Uh, just do that. Uh, and then once you have it installed, you can use uh, the Elfer Go command and then load up a particular URL. So I'm just going to copy this URL and use uh, meta x Elfer Go. And then I'll paste in the URL in the echo area here. And then it will load it up. Let me see if I can scale this a bit. Text scale increase. Okay. So this is what a Gemini page looks like inside of Emacs. Uh, and this is part of the thing that's great about Gemini to me is that uh, the clients for the protocol can be written in, in a very simple fashion and everything's displayed in a very simple fashion. So you can have an embedded client in Emacs that is very capable of doing everything that you would need to do with Gemini. So you don't have to have a separate program to go look at a Gemini page. You can just have it right in Emacs or you can have it as a console application if you prefer to use console applications. So. <clears throat> It's, uh, it's very cool for that uh, aspect. So uh, as we can see here, very simple representation of things. 
you can see that there are um, different sizes of headings here. There's like bulleted lists, there's links. Um, and that's basically all that we really see on this page. And that's the majority of what you would see in a normal Gemini site. Um, and all of this markup, actually, what you see here is, is pretty close to what the actual markup for the site looks like. And in fact, I believe that there is a button I can press, maybe it's period, that shows the raw uh, content of the site. So now you can see what the actual Gemini code for the site looks like. And it looks basically just like what we saw before. The headings are starting with these hash characters, the bulleted lists start with star, uh, and the links here start with this little arrow, like the equal sign and then the uh, closing arrow or angle bracket, I guess you could say. So very simple uh, uh, representation. Let me just see, how do I get back from here? I'll, I'll try to go. What's what's the link to DistroTube's go for site? Uh, L for go. Oh, I can just press G, I forgot about that. Okay, I pulled back up the normal thing. I think it's, uh, is it DistroTube.com? Let's see, Gemini colon slash slash DistroTube.com. Probably not going to work. It might be under some other thing. Pewter says it would be cool if it served org mode page, pages. Well, you can generate a Gemini site from org mode pages, and I'll show you how to do that in a little bit. So anyway, um, if you want to learn about Gemini, uh, you should definitely check out the... This is the main page, basically, uh, for Gemini. It's the Gemini.circumlunar.space. Um, and uh, you can look at the documentation here. So if we move down to this link, we can press Enter and then jump right into the documentation page. There's the frequently asked questions, protocol specification. And as I mentioned, it's, it's pretty short. Um, let's see, there's what, four major sections, five major sections. Yeah, so it's, it's not very, it's maybe a little bit longer than I made it sound like, but it's not that long. And it's actually, I, I read it this morning basically and wrote an outline of it myself in this presentation. So that tells you how long it takes. Maybe it took me 30 minutes to understand what the protocol does. So uh, very, very straightforward. Uh, it should be noted that this is not a final specification for the protocol. However, I think it hasn't changed very much recently because uh, they've kind of narrowed in on what the big parts of the protocol are. So if you were to write a client or a server for it right now, you probably wouldn't have to worry about it changing very frequently out from under you. Uh, let's see. Uh, Case Duckworth says it could serve org mode pages, just send a mime type with text org. That is actually true. You could do that uh, if Elfer uh, would load the org mode pages as an org file. So that's a, good, that's a really good point. You could actually have a fully org mode website inside of Emacs with Elfer, but you, you, anyone else who uses a Gemini client wouldn't be able to load those things the right way. They could see probably the, the text based. Uh, org mode file shown as a page, but uh, it wouldn't have the normal highlighting that you would see whenever you're loading it in Emacs. Uh, Elephant says, writing a client sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Drishal says, Gemini colon slash slash distro dot two. Okay, that, that was my next guess. So, uh, Gemini colon slash slash distro dot tube. So yeah, uh, Derek has a very nice ASCII banner here. That's another cool thing you can do with uh, Gemini pages. You can basically have these little blocks with uh, with ASCII characters to make it look really cool, like it's the old demo scene stuff. And his site looks really nice, actually. Uh, it's, it's well presented for for what you can do with with Gemini. If I press the the uh, period, you'll see this is how he actually got that ASCII to show up. Basically, it's just raw character codes. Um, and uh, yeah, you have it in these, basically in this fenced block. It's almost like Markdown where you have the code block where it has like the three uh, grave characters, the dash, 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 whatever that is, grave, grave, grave. Um, when you put that in there, it will make a literal display of whatever it is you put inside that block. Yeah, it's like BBS era, that's pretty cool. All right, so let me back out of that one. Um, so let's see, there's also a search engine that you can use on Gemini. It's called Gus. Uh, the G Gemini Universal Search is at gus.guru on the uh, Gemini protocol. So if I were to open that up, uh, let's see. Then basically you can search for anything on Gemini. If I were to do, hit the search Gus link here, uh, what's going to happen is I'm going to hit a page and it's going to prompt me for an input. So if you look down here in the echo area, there's actually a prompt for the search query. So if I were to type in Emacs and press enter, uh, then it will show me the links to all sites that it knows about that are talking about Emacs. And apparently somebody has their .file site there. Somebody else has their blog with a, a tag page about uh, Emacs. 
Um, oh, is it out of date? Uh, Case says that Gus is out of date. Uh, maybe, there was another one called Houston or something, I think. Um, yeah, a couple other pages. So yeah, basically, if you wanted to find things on Gemini, you could use one of the search engines that are uh, made for that. Generally, what happens is if you want to get your site into uh, one of these search engines, you have to go submit your, your link to it. And the reason why is because if your site is not linked to by some other site in Gemini, then the, the web crawler can't find it. So you'll have to go tell it about your site. It's like the old days of, uh, of Google, where you had to go submit your site to Google so that they would uh, index it. Um, I think I saw the place where you do that. Oh, right. At the very bottom of the page here, uh, let Gus know your, your Gemini URL exists. And Elephant says, you can add a description of the ASCII art for screen readers by putting a description on the same line as the opening block. That's pretty cool. Let's see. Pavel says, uh, in my opinion, something like Gemini can be okay if the site can be plain text, but that's not web developers are paid for. There's no way to implement that just about any business logic with Gemini, unfortunately. I think... Uh, there, is, there are ways to implement business logic with Gemini, and I've got some ideas on that, but uh, it's not going to be the same as the normal web. So you, the people who are going to be using Gemini are not the mainstream internet users. So I don't think that anybody here should expect that, you know, mainstream people are going to be using this. Uh, that's actually, it's kind of funny because that's basically what Luke Smith was complaining about, about uh, Gopher and Gemini in his video this morning, basically saying, I don't know why I would host a site on Gemini whenever the average person is not going to come to my site. Well, in my opinion, that's not the point. You know, the, the average user is, does, isn't going to care about like a very simple representation of a web page. So, yeah, if, if you're making a website on Gemini, then you know pretty sure that no average user is going to come to your site. But, uh, you know, it's really up for, for anybody's opinion, I guess. Piotr says, alternative web without garbage would be cool. Yes, I agree. All right, so let me go back to my uh, my notes here. Uh, there's also a listing of known Gemini hosts. If you go to this page on Gus, basically all the sites that have been registered with Gus or, or sites that have been found by Gus, um, they will tell you, they basically have a whole list that you can use. So let me just drop that in. And there's quite a lot of sites here and there may be even some names that you recognize in this list like let's say uh, Drew DeVault who is the guy who created uh, Source Hut um, just lots lots and lots of sites so there's a lot of places you can go and look and it's it's possible to actually go and look at all of the uh, the Gemini sites because there aren't that many of them so if you want to go just see what kind of things people are doing it's very easy to go do that of course I'm not going to go through this list and look at every one of them but if, if you wanted to you could do that Oh, I forgot about Acid Draw. I gotta go use that program because I want to make a really cool banner for uh, for my own personal page. Yeah, Drishal, that's that's basically what I was saying. Is is Luke uh, Luke doesn't like Gemini because average people can't use it. I think that that's the wrong way to look at it. David Jeters asks, "Why do people want to use Gemini?" I will uh, I will I'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> Peter says, my only request for an addition to the Gemini protocol is hidden, unpausable middies. Yeah, you'll definitely get that 1992 internet flavor uh, doing that. Garjola asks, what is needed to serve a Gemini site? Uh, there are plenty of server implementations out there in a variety, variety of different languages. So all you really need is one of those. However, you can post uh, Gemini sites on SourceHut pages uh, very easily. And I will show you how I do that uh, a little bit later. Marcel, we might talk about that later in the stream. All right, so let's see. Now, this table is not looking very good here, so I apologize for that. I don't know why whenever I go into this mode, uh, tables get jacked up, but that's what happened. So um, just a little bit of uh, description of the key bindings for Elfer, just because it's useful to know these things. They're not right. They're not what you would expect, but they're very simple and easy to use once you've sort of started to um, uh, get used to it. Uh, one thing I would like to do eventually is maybe to set up some bindings in Evil Collection to make them more Evil-like or Vim-like, but uh, right now they're not very Vim-like. Like if you see G, if you press G, it doesn't do what you think it will do in a Vim-style keybinding configuration, but that's fine. So inside of Elfer, if you uh, press G, can I just press Enter? Ah, okay, let me just do Elfer. So, uh... 
try timed out. Great. Okay, let me go. Was it O? Yeah. Oh, capital U. Okay, that's the right one. Okay, so if you go, if you open up Elfer using just the Elfer command, usually by default, it's going to bring up this start page. And it, the start page actually tells you a lot of key bindings. So if you want to learn really quickly what the key bindings are, this is a good place to go look. Um, but uh, the, the most important one is obviously going to be navigating to our U URL. If you press G, then it pulls up the, the prompt at the bottom of the screen so that you can do that. Um, then there's like, you know, selecting different links on the page. So let me go to a, a page actually. Um, G Gemini. Gemini.circumlunar.space. I believe that's the URL. Okay, cool. Yeah, so um, I think if you press O, it lets you edit the current URL in case you want to type in more of the URL path on, that, on the same site. If you go to a page into the site, let's just go somewhere in the site and press capital O, it will bring you back to the root URL of the site. Uh, if you press C on a link, it will copy that link. If you press capital C, it will copy the link to the current page you're on. So it's just bindings like that. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them because that would be boring, but um, it's really easy to use this once you get uh, started with it. And once you start navigating around, then you're going to be moving really fast through these pages. One other really cool thing is pressing M. And basically, if you use a completion framework like uh, Ivy or uh, Selectrum, uh, Helm, etc., you're going to get this completion list of all the links on the page so you can very easily navigate to any of them. So I'm going to press uh, enter on this Houston search engine. It will navigate directly to that. Um, and right now it seems to not be responding, which is great. So I can press U to go back. Um, and also it aborts a, a page navigation in progress. So that's uh, it, it's pretty simple and straightforward. And the nice thing is it's built right in here. I mean, if I wanted to, I could split this window and look at my uh, presentation right under it, which I might actually continue to do because it's kind of useful. So uh, it's, it's very cool. Uh, I think it's, Elfer is a great package for, for using this stuff. Elfer actually started as a Gopher client. So if you want to try out Gopher also, uh, Elfer is probably pretty well suited for that. And then later, whenever Gemini showed up, they added Gemini support instead of Elfer. So uh, give that package a try if you want to go look at some uh, some Gemini sites because it's, it's really cool. All right, so let's close this one real quick. So let's talk about the actual markup. We saw a little bit of that before, but um, let's talk about what the actual markup is for this uh, this protocol, I suppose. Uh, let's see, Ramsey says, I think a useful workflow for your presentation is use a tab for the chat and your presentation, other tab for whatever you want to show. I use a different workspace for that. Uh, but the thing is, I'm trying to keep the chat open so I can see what, I'm, see what people are saying at the same time. See you, Eric. Thanks for coming. All right, so um, so basically the Gemini markup is called Gemtex. So this is basically the name that is used to refer to uh, Gemini markup, it, like HTML is for for uh, for HTTP. Uh, it has a file extension of .gmi. So if you see a .gmi file somewhere, it's probably a Gemini markup file, unless some other program also thinks that GMI is their extension. And then, like I was saying before, it's very Markdown inspired. If you've ever written any Markdown before uh, for like a, you know the documentation page for a repository on GitHub or something like that, then you'll be right at home writing out raw uh, Gemini gem text. Uh, the MIME type is pretty obviously going to be text slash Gemini because it's a text-based uh, markup format. And the interesting thing about the format is that it's line oriented, meaning that uh, each line has a certain type associated with it. And usually you can tell what type that line is going to be within the first three characters of that line. So if you notice, a lot of the syntax will have things that, that occur at the very beginning of the line that tell you what the rest of that line is supposed to be. Um, so it makes it very easy for a um, a client to know how to interpret any line in a, in a Gemini text file. That way it's very e easy to render the context, the contents. Um, there's a couple links here if you want to get more details on that. And I gave the Gemini links instead of the uh, HTTP links because you should go look at it in Gemini instead. Uh, there's also a very quick cheat sheet, but honestly, you don't really need it after you've learned the basics because it's very straightforward. So. Uh, normal text lines. Text is just you start writing text on a line like basically this one right here. You just start writing text. Uh, so the client handles line wrapping and they basically treat a single line as a paragraph. So if you want a paragraph of text, don't go wrapping the lines yourself using enter. Just write a single straight line and then whatever client loads up your page is going to wrap that for you. 
Uh, so if you do a new line at the end of the line, it's going to treat the next line as a new line, basically. Uh, also, uh, blank lines are rendered verbatim. So if you want to have spacing between paragraphs, you just you, you write a whole line and you press enter twice and then start writing another line and then you will have you know one blank space inside of your Gemini document. It's actually kind of nice because you know exactly how your um, your document is going to be rendered whenever a, a client interprets it like that. So uh, also short lines are not joined. So if you have a very short line and then you you press enter and you have a line after that, they're not going to be joined together or wrapped in any certain way. Uh, basically, they're going to be shown as, exactly as written. So text is very straightforward to display in Gemini. Headings are markdown style with the hash character, prefix character in front of uh, the heading. And there's only three levels of heading. So you can't have arbitrary heading levels. There's only three levels. And uh, so it's like one hash, two hashes or three hashes, basically, just like you would see in Markdown. That's the only syntax available for setting headings inside of your documents. And that's basically all there is to say about it. I mean, that's that's just it. It's very simple. Uh, links are um, written on a line of their own. So if you remember what I said about this being a line oriented protocol, uh, you can't have an embedded link inside of a line of text because the, the client would need to be looking inside of that line of text to find where a link is to be able to display it properly. So to make the client simpler, you have to keep links separate from text and from any other element. You can't have a link in a heading either. So um, basically the format is you use the equal and close angle bracket uh, character to make like an arrow and then there's a space I think the space is technically optional but you should probably put it there then the URL of whatever you want to link to this can be in Gemini it can be HTTP HTTPS or any other protocol it's a normal URI format and then a space and then after that is any text you want to use to describe this URL so uh, this basically would be a link to system crafters on Gemini and this whole text here even though it has spaces and no quotation marks this is what the text of the link is going to be in in, the, in in the end for lists uh, you can use simple bulleted lists but they don't allow nesting so it's only flat bulleted lists and I didn't actually give an ex example here but let me just write one up really quickly so basically if you have um, star oh uh, org mode is not liking this right now um can i do quote no nah. it's not gonna let me do a literal here i think that's unfortunate but basically it's it's star yeah that's not gonna work either can i escape you somehow yeah maybe that okay so so ignore the slashes but item two item three so basically if you had these three lines with the ha the asterisks asterisks uh, at the beginning then you would um th those would be three three bulleted items in a list uh they don't do numbering automatically there's no way to get numbering if you want numbering basically you just write numbered lists yourself and it just shows up correctly because of the way that uh uh gemini works um uh, Peter Demu says uh, the lack of embedded links makes me think that a common pattern for Gemini pages would be to have a site map at the top or bottom of pages. Uh, yeah, I think you see that a lot. You also see links under a section. So you'll see like a paragraph of text and then there will be like three or four links under that for all the things that were mentioned in that section. And I actually think that's kind of nice. And I, and I sort of naturally do that myself sometimes when I'm writing out the show notes for System Crafters episodes, like when I'm giving links to like the Emacs manual and stuff. So uh, it makes sense as a way to do it. And I think it makes it easier to actually digest what's in the text because you don't have to be trying to track all the links that are around inside of the, uh, the actual written text. Um, so block quotes. So if you want to quote something, uh, like maybe make some text look a little bit different than the rest, like if you're quoting someone's, uh, some, something someone said, or if maybe you want to call out a specific instruction, like a note for some instruction on a page, um, you can use the uh, closing angle bracket as the first character on a line, and then anything that comes after that is going to be part of the block quote. Now, uh, keep in mind that this is line oriented, so this block quote should be a full line of text. And if you want it to have multiple lines, just keep typing on a single line and then the client will wrap that around to be part of the full block quote. So you don't need to do uh, separate uh, lines like if you were doing a reply to a, te a plain text email. You should just just skip that part. Um, I, you, could, you could probably do it, but I don't know how clients are going to represent that. So I would say better to just do a single line and let the client wrap the text. And lastly, uh, code blocks, or I guess you could say preformatted text blocks. 
um, use the markdown style triple grave fenced blocks. So usually if you've, if you've written a markdown file that goes up on GitHub, you've probably seen this before where you have this uh, grave, 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 then some text and then grave, grave, grave. Basically it just makes whatever's inside of those lines inside of those two fences, I guess you could call them, they get uh, displayed literally. They don't get processed by the client. So if you wanted to give example of some Gemini uh, markup inside of your page, you could use these fences to make that section be literally displayed and not formatted basically based on the Gemini protocol. Uh, and that's basically it for all the markup. I don't think there's anything else to the markup aside from that. So you can see it's very simple. And if you were to be writing a client um, you could implement this very easily. Like this is simple kind of text processing, uh, no, nothing that complicated here. And uh, like I mentioned before, uh, instead of using images on your site, you can use some leet ASCII art from, you know, the mid to late nineties to, uh, or even earlier than that, I suppose, to, to make your site look cooler. Uh, I like how DistroTube did his. I think Drew DeVault's website also has something like that. Let's, let's head there really quickly. I'll show you. So I'll load up uh, Gemini colon slash slash Drew And uh, he has this rocket with a cool stylization of his name uh, here at the top. And uh, if you press uh, period, you'll see that basically he's got that sort of alt text here in his uh, logo. And it's the three three hashes and then the alt text and then whatever the, the literal text is to, to be displayed. Uh, Matthew asks, uh, would language specific colors have to be done on the client since you mentioned no stylings? Yeah, I believe so. And I think that would be pretty straightforward because I think you could follow the same strategy that GitHub uses where you put the language right after the beginning of the fence block. And if the, uh, if the client interpreted that as the name of a language, then they could do syntax highlighting as they wanted to. So uh, I think that's sort of up to the client to decide to do that. And then for th there to be sort of a community consensus about what the, the format of saying that this is a code language uh, so that other clients could also implement it. All right. So uh, let's look at the, the actual protocol. And I know that probably this is the point where a lot of people will want to go to sleep, but actually it's quite interesting, the protocol, because it's very simple, way simpler than HTTP, if you ever have learned HTTP before. Uh, so uh, this won't actually be so boring, I think. But I'll try to keep it short nonetheless. So basically, uh, the request flow, whenever you make a request to a Gemini server, this is basically what happens. You, you've established the connection to the server to make a request. Uh, the server accepts that request and then initiates this TLS handshake, which basically means um, it tells you about its, its uh, public key for encryption, then you establish an encrypted uh, key basically for the remainder of the connection to actually transmit the data in an encrypted fashion across the wire. So every connection to a Gemini server is encrypted, basically. Uh, then the client will validate the server certificate, basically to say whether the server is who they say they are, because you don't want to be going to some server that's lying about who they are. Uh, and then the client will send a single line request detail string that's terminated with uh, the carriage return and, and line feed characters, which basically slash R slash N. If you've uh, looked at carriage returns and stuff like that before, that, that doesn't look any different than usual to you. Uh, and then the server, server will send a single line response back uh, to the client in response to whatever they requested. And if there was an error as part of the, the request, then the connection will be closed immediately. Otherwise, the server will then, after that line, will write all the body of the response back and then terminate the connection. So if you know anything about HTTP, there's a lot of stuff that HTTP does that is missing from here. Uh, and that's because they're trying to keep things very simple compared to the uh, in, compared to HTTP, basically. Uh, so for the request for the client making a request to the server, it's literally just you 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 write the URL to the the server, and then you use slash r slash n or, or crlf basically to to do a new line, and that's it. You just write the URL and then give a new line, and that is you making requests to the server. Then when the server responds to you, they give you a status code, a numeric status code, and then the space character. So just nu numeric code, space, and then some string that just gives information about the response, and then the new line. So it's not a whole bunch of text. It's just one line, basically. And this meta section, which is basically like the arbitrary information that comes back, can only be up to 1024 bytes. So it can't be very big. 
but the actual body of the response could be as long as it needs to be. Um, so they, they don't really make any specification about that as far as I know. So if you want to see an example of a response, you can look at this line. Uh, so the response code would be 50 and then the meta, we have a space after the 50 and then we have server has exploded, which is the meta string and then the new line. And that's it. That's all there is for a, a request being sent to the, to the server and then a response coming back from the server basically. So, um, if you've ever looked at the actual request response pattern for HTTP, there's way, way more lines involved. There's all kinds of arbitrary headers that could be sent. There's all kinds of configuration parameters that can be sent. Um, it, there's, there's a lot more stuff that you have to deal with for HTTP. So Gemini is way simpler. Um, there's also no content length or end of response signifiers. So there's no, there's nothing saying how much, how big the content is. So um, it, this is all connection oriented where a single request is a single connection. There's no sharing of a connection, a single connection for multiple requests like you can do in HTTP. So it's, it's very primitive in that sense, but also it, it makes sense because the, the size of these pages is gonna be way smaller than what you would normally get on an HTTP server. So you don't need to batch a bunch of requests together to get a whole lot of different images and, and whatnot. So it makes sense to have this be more of a connection oriented protocol. There's also no keep alive uh, to, to keep the connection open to do multiple requests, like we mentioned. And there's also no compression or chunking of bodies. So there's no compression of data that's coming back from the server. Uh, that's something that also gets done quite often for uh, HTTP responses for text files and whatnot, because you can compress them to make them smaller so that it doesn't take up as much bandwidth. But like I said, you don't really need that for Gemini because it's literally just text most of the time. So the status codes are much simpler compared to HTTP. If you know anything about HTTP, there's different uh, code ranges. So like the 200 range of codes is like success codes. 300 is like um, different responses, like maybe the location of the document moved. Uh, 400 is like client errors. 500 is server errors. Uh, there's a similar pattern in Gemini, but there's less codes. There's only two digits instead of three. And the, the, the one code, the one X code is actually quite interesting because it's a response that's, response that says, send a prompt to the user. So it says prompt the user for a string basically. So uh, whenever the server responds with 10 as a status code, the next thing that's the meta string after that 10 is gonna be the prompt string to give to the, to the user. So if I go to a site and it re responds with 10, give me your name, then it's gonna show me in my client, give me your name. And I type in my name. And the expectation is that once the user types in that string, then the client is going to make a request again to that same URL and then pass that string as a query parameter. So uh, it's a very simple way of having some kind of interaction with the user that doesn't require forms on the page. Now, obviously, you can't make complex forms like this because it's just going to be annoying, but um, it does give you some way to do some low level interaction with a, a Gemini page. Uh, 2x is a successful request, very similar to HTTP. The meta string will have the my media type of the response. So basically, it would be like, 20 and then text slash Gemini for a Gemini page response. Uh, you could also return images, you return videos, you can return whatever you want. It's just a matter of whether the client will display them somehow. Uh, 3x is for redirecting to a different page and the URL will be the meta string that is part of that response. So 30 space and then the URL to go to instead. Um, 4x is temporary failure is something that you can try again later and maybe it will work. The meta string will contain the error message that is meant to be displayed to the user. Uh, 5x is a permanent failure that is non-recoverable. There's no sense in trying it again. Uh, meta will also contain that human readable error text. And then 6x is also another interesting part of the Gemini protocol, which is that it will prompt for a client certificate for the user to access the page. So basically you have to use a certificate to, to get a response back. And uh, this actually brings us to the next section where we talk about uh, authentication with Gemini servers. But just to, to finish up what I was saying before, uh, this set of uh, codes is very easy to deal with. And the nice thing is that you only need to worry about the first digit of these codes. You don't have to care about what the the second the second number is. There, there are meanings to the second number. So like 11 or 12, they may have other meanings, but the first character is all you need to actually know how to process the response. You don't have to care about the second character because it's just extra information. So uh, very, very simple. I think it'd be very easy to write, write a client that can handle these uh, re request response patterns. So 
Uh, TLS is a requirement for servers. You have to have a TLS certificate or a, an SSH or SSL certificate on the server so that the um, communication can be encrypted and also so the client can verify the identity of the server. Um, that's pretty easy these days though because there's Let's Encrypt and CertBot that make it easy for you to create a, a certificate that's free so you don't have to pay for this kind of thing anymore. If you remember back, you know, 10 years ago, you would have to pay at least 100 bucks to get a certificate that was signed by a certificate authority so that you were a legitimate, you know, website basically. But uh, now it's easy to do that. So clients can also be authenticated using client certificates. Um, this can be an interesting way to authenticate users for dynamic functionality without requiring username password pairs. So if you think about what Gemini is trying to do, it's basically giving the power back to the user to use whatever client they want and display the information that comes back from these pages however they want and n not give the, all the power to the person running the server. Uh, this is also interesting for, from an authentication perspective because now you have a certificate and you're basically giving your public key to the server so they can authenticate you for future client requests. Um, so you don't have to have a password on somebody's server in this case. You have your own certificate that you keep and then you tell them what your public key is and then they can verify you based on that. Uh, the other nice thing about this is that if websites are using client certificates for authentication of users, then there's no way that someone could hack the server and get all the user passwords and then crack your other accounts because all they have on the server is just your public key for your certificate. They would have to go hack your computer to get your private key to then authenticate just with that website for uh, uh, as your identity, basically. And I mean, by that point, you're already really hacked. So there's nothing to worry about there. But the nice thing is that there's no set of passwords that can be cracked on a website that uh, can be used against you somewhere else. Uh, I think it's kind of interesting because you don't have to worry about maintaining multiple passwords for different sites or maintaining um, uh, you're remembering what the password is or remembering what your username is. If you use a Gemini site that wants you to log in somehow, you just tell them what your public key is and then you just go use the site with your existing certificate. You can also generate uh, random self-signed certificates as well. You can just tell them here, here's my, my public key. This is a special key I generated just for this site and, and that's it. So uh, it, it allows for some very interesting ways of using sites that are different than what we do today with the modern web. Um, also, one, one last interesting aspect, uh, client certificates could also be used like opt-in cookies or session tokens for sites. So uh, if you know anything about cookies, basically when you go to a website, um, the server will give a cookie to your browser that then the browser will send back to the server anytime you visit it. And this is a way that uh, certain websites will track you around the internet because if, uh, if a part of a web page is... Um, sending a cookie to you, then if you if you go to another web page that also responds to that cookie, then they can also see, oh, I, you've also been here. So I, I'm not really doing a good, a good job of explaining how that works, but basically cookies are a way for people to track you around the internet. And uh, this is something that is ex explicitly not done in, uh, in Gemini. So the way that you do session tokens in Gemini would be to use uh, certificates. So basically you create a, a, a one-time use certificate for this particular website and then that basically is your session from that point forward you tell them what your public key is and then uh you just keep using the site and they they know it's you because every request you make to the server has been authenticated using that key uh peter says that's a very clever use of public private keys yeah i think it's kind of awesome and uh i think it makes a lot more sense than username password peter says uh, cookies are also bad for your teeth yeah especially if you uh, eat them before bed and don't brush your teeth don't ask me how i know that Okay, so let's talk about uh, why Gemini, Gemini matters. So after talking all about this protocol, why should you care about Gemini? Why would anybody care about Gemini? Well, like I mentioned, uh, it, it's designed for private, designed with privacy in mind. So basically, it's made so that a website cannot easily track you. They know where you're coming from whenever you make a request to the site because they can see your IP address, but they, they don't know anything else about you other than what you're willing to give to them. Uh, also, the, the pages don't have any kind of dynamic scripting in them, so they can't do anything sneaky behind the scenes or make requests to other websites. Um, so it, it's really, and also the protocol, does, as you saw, it doesn't have any extensibility points. It doesn't have any way to inject any sneaky tracking information in headers or cookies or anything like that. So it's, there, there's no way that a website can add anything that's not meant to be there. 
Uh, also, there's no need for huge CPU draining clients. If you've tried to use a modern web browser, they're enormous. Uh, they, it takes forever to compile the code for them if you have to compile it for some reason. And there's all kinds of, of stuff in there that uh, you don't really need most of the, in most cases. There's, there's like drivers for Xbox... Uh, Xbox controllers inside of Chromium, for God's sake. I mean, there's all kinds of crazy stuff that's in these browsers that you don't really need. And we're we've, we're sitting here with browsers open all day long, taking up all of our RAM and, you know, doing stuff behind the scenes and all this stuff. So it's better if a lot of the sites that you use for get, gathering information that you need didn't require the use of such a huge program um, that, that did a bunch of extraneous stuff that's not necessary for you to just get that information. If you want to look something up, you don't need to have to, to load up a website that's got a whole bunch of JavaScript and CSS and images and everything. It'd be better if you could just use a simple text-based website that uh, you could use in your program, in your editor or whatever, without having to have a separate program. Um, and you can easily browse it from, from within Emacs or terminal clients. I think it's great that you can use this inside of Emacs. Um, it's possible to browse the web using EWW and some other browsers that are inside of Emacs, but most websites are not designed to be used with EWW um, or or any other kind of console-based browser. So you're going to have a hard time looking at modern websites inside of inside of Emacs. Uh, not the same for Gemini because Elfer is a great client and Gemini is made to be displayed in this kind of client. So uh, I think it's excellent that you have that freedom to choose what type of client you use and to use it most effectively effectively for you. I mean, the nice thing, like if we were, we were to go back to Elfer really quickly. I can go on this page, I can navigate around using evil key bindings, I can select text, copy it very easily, I don't have to do anything stupid, I don't have to use my mouse to go select text. Uh, there, there's so many things that you can do that you don't have to worry about, or that, that's hard to do basically inside of a browser. You don't need to have to install, uh, what, what is it, uh, Vimium or uh, any of the like the Vim based key binding systems or use Qt Browser or anything else. You can just use the, the bindings for it already uh, inside of Emacs in the client for Gemini. So I don't know, I think it's a lot better to have this ability to use your own client, your own program, the way that you've set it up, the way that you want, and not have to use some other third party program that you have to configure separately. Uh, and also it is, it's an oasis for computer enthusiasts away from the modern web. And frankly, I think this is the most important part. Uh, and I think this is the part that Luke Smith doesn't get yet. I think he'll understand pretty soon that this is what it's really about. Basically, uh, the modern web has kind of turned sour in a sense. I mean, like social media has just destroyed everything, in my opinion. I mean, social media is kind of a necessary evil these days. Obviously, I'm using social media. I'm using YouTube right now. I'm using Twitter for, you know, tweeting about videos and stuff. But um, I feel like it's kind of ruined the spirit of the Internet. The, the early Internet in like the 90s was a lot different place than it is now. So I think that uh, Gemini gives us the ability to sort of go back in time a little bit and to experience a more nascent space uh, like the, the early internet was and focus on you know sharing ideas and information rather than having crazy websites. So uh, I think it's a cool place to try you know hosting a site, hosting a blog and maybe only have part of your stuff on Gemini so that other people can go find you there instead of the main uh, HTTP web, whatever. Um, I think it'd be interesting for all of us to sort of participate in the space and see if we can re recapture some of that magic of the early internet. So my plan is to uh, redo my website and actually start blogging, blogging, or just writing articles, basically just, just simple stuff, you know, no, no, nothing that complicated, but doing it mostly on Gemini and not on my main, uh, you know, modern web HTTP website uh, for davidwill.com. So um, I, I think it's gonna be fun. It's something I'm gonna start experimenting with pretty soon and uh, it's it's pretty easy. Uh, so let me show you how I'm gonna do that. Uh, so there's a little bit of a bonus section here. Uh, in fact, let me just, uh, let, let me stop for a second and look at the, the comments because I've been ignoring the chat for a bit here and just, you know, rambling basically. Uh, Peter says there's no user agent. Uh, the most they could do is use your IP address to dynamically generate a page. Yep, that's true. <laughs> Lucas says compiling those things, I think he means browsers, uh, takes an eternity. Yeah, anytime on Geeks when I have to update Chromium or Firefox or uh, Qt Web Engine for a Qt browser and they don't have a pre-compiled binary ready, then I basically just cancel the, upload, the upgrade because I don't want to have to sit and wait for an hour and a half for it to compile. 
Uh, Benoit says, many of the issues I have while coding comes from my browser or bloated Electron apps taking all of my CPU or RAM. Yeah, I, my computer was melting down last night when I was preparing for the stream. Um, it basically took up all, all of my RAM and I had to go to a, a separate TTY and start killing pro processes so I could get back in and use Emacs again. Let's see. Uh, Luis says, uh, it's great for docs, blog posts, journals. It's great for learning content with only text. Yeah, I think it's really cool for those things. I mean, that's, that's the most important part, to be honest. Like, the, the benefit of the internet is the ability to share ideas and information with other people, like teaching people things or, you know, coming up with your own cool libraries and, and tools and then sharing them with other, other people. This is great for that. You don't need to have a normal HTTP web page for that. Uh, Case says, I think Drew DeVault has P uh, POSIX man pages with CGI on there. Yeah, I mean, it is possible to, to do dynamic sites with Gemini. It doesn't have to be plain uh, static text files. You can have a server that does dynamic com uh, computation of the text and then returns it back. So sort of like the PHP web or the, the CGI bin web way back in there. Uh, Tomas says, you need to use social media responsibly nowadays, like just like alcohol and other drugs. Yeah, it, it is basically a... A different kind of drug it's basically a, a a it creates drugs in your brain basically let's see what else <laughs> firefox burned my ram well maybe so jerry says a gemini wikipedia you could probably do something like that yeah kaya we talked about luke smith's video before all right so uh last week i showed I uh, showed how to use Emacs and org mode to generate websites and, and then publish them to Source Hut, uh, basically static websites on Source Hut. So I, I was thinking to myself, you know, it'd be really cool to write a custom uh, exporter backend that exports Gemini. So I went to search really quickly to see if anybody else had written one, and it turns out someone did write one. Uh, so there is a, a package called OX Gemini, and the repo for this is on Source Hut. Let me see if this will pop up really quick. All right, so this is by uh, someone named Justin Abrams. And uh, basically, it's just a very simple implementation of, a, um, of an export backend that will take your org mode files and then generate that uh, gem, what was it, gem text markup that we saw before. And since Gemini is very simple, this is actually about a, I don't know, 275 line Emacs list file. So that should go to show <clears throat> it's pretty easy to export Gemini from uh, from org mode files. And I would say probably a third of that is comments, or maybe even half of its comments. So it's it's not very much. So um, what, what I did was basically just add an additional publish target inside of my website uh, for systemcrafters.cc that generates this for, uh, for Gemini. Let me go find that really quickly. CD projects, sites, system crafters. Oh, is it not here? Ah, okay, that's it. So I haven't pulled it on this machine yet, so let me just pull this down really quickly. Okay, so I'll pull up my publish.el really fast. Um, one difference here is that I, I am installing OX Gemini here using a use package statement toward the top. And then really the only difference is that I'm adding an additional uh, published project to the org published project A list for the Gemini site. And it's basically the same as what I have here for the main site. The difference is that I'm changing the publishing function to this org Gemini published to Gemini instead. Um, and I've written my own customization of that function, sort of like the other, because basically I'm trying to gen generate sites that have a slash at the end of the URL instead of like a file with an extension. So uh, that's the only customization I did to make this work. And, uh, and I basically got a Gemini site that works just like the normal website. So if I were to go to that in, in Elfer, uh, Gemini colon slash slash systemcrafters.cc, then you can see I, we have the system crafter site here. Um, and I'll, I'll show you a couple of different things that are, are what I would call wrong in this output compared to what uh, you would expect to see on a Gemini site. Uh, but before I do that, let me just navigate around a little bit so you can see things. So uh, we have the normal information here, like the links to the social media uh, and the video series link where we have all the uh, series that, that we have on the site. Um, and then if you go to any of the different series, if I click on this link here uh, and go to an episode for Introduction to GNU Geeks, 
then you see all the show notes basically for uh, for that episode. So basically all the same org mode files that I have are being generated out as Gemini files. And then I publish those to uh, Source Hut pages. Um, so a couple of things that I, I'm not so crazy about uh, in the current output, and I understand why that's the case. So it basically is a matter of me having to adjust the way that I write my show notes and websites. Um, first of all, because we said that you can't have inline links in text, what this exporter is doing with inline links is putting brackets around where the link would have been, and then it drops down to a line below and then uh, creates the link there. So in any section of text where I have links, it's going to basically drop them below that section. So if I were to go, let's see. Yeah, here's another one. So I have a few different links here in this section. I think it does it per heading, basically. So in this heading, I have a bunch of links in this text. And then it, it generates them all after the text. Now, if I were to do this over again, if I were to do this in a way that would be more native to Gemini, I would just make my own links down here with proper um, text on them so that it's more obvious what it is that I'm, I'm referring to instead of having all these inline links here. Uh, so I think that as far as like a, an information design standpoint, like how, how you're organizing your information so that it's more effective for the user, uh, probably after every paragraph that has a link or two, a couple things you might want to link to, maybe I would drop a couple links after that. Or maybe in this section where there's kind of a lot more text that all belongs together, I would have this list afterward, but I would not have all the inline kind of linking in the text. But I would just come down and have the links to all the things I mentioned, but have a little bit more description to sort of connect it to the text that was there before. Uh, so that's something I'll have to go and try to do. Um, to, uh, to, to make this look a little bit better as a Gemini output. Um, but that's, that's, that's the biggest problem I think I saw so far. The other thing that I did not like is the fact that there's a lot of places where a couple of new lines get inserted. And it, to me, it's just too much spacing. It just doesn't look right. If you look at other people's handcrafted uh, Gemini sites by comparison, there's not so much spacing. Things flow a little bit better. Uh, there's also not any kind of uh, spacing at the top here. This looked kind of weird to me. So basically, um, I I would prefer it if um, that all those spaces were taken out. Now, obviously, I can go and change the code of that back end, maybe contribute some changes back to uh, Justin Abrams to to help with that. It really just depends on, you know, how he sees that project going. Uh, Pavel gives a suggestion. I'd write links, write links in articles like one, two, et cetera. Yeah, that's more of like the footnote style. And I think that's actually a really good idea. Uh, it might make it easier for people to uh, follow those links. So basically in the text, uh, let's say right here where I mentioned Flatpak. Um, with Flatpak, after this text, instead of having the brackets around it, you could have just bracket, uh, open bracket, one, close bracket. And then in the links list, you could have the open, close, one bracket there to say, this is what I'm linking to, basically. Uh, pa Pavel says, that's the it seems to be the accepted way to cite stuff in a lot of places. Yeah, it, it seems like the right way to do it. Uh, let's see, what else is interesting? I don't think there's anything else that special there. Uh, you can see that the um, the URL here is a normal URL and the end of it ends in a slash. That's basically that customization I did so that the it wouldn't be like introduction.gmi. Now it's introduction slash because I'm generating the output path as introduction slash index.gmi. So uh, the, the clients also typically support that index.gmi convention that uh, HTML browsers support for index.html for like the root page of a given URL path. Uh, Garjola asks, how are foot org footnotes exported by org uh, Gemini? I haven't tried it yet, so I don't actually know. And I don't remember the syntax, so I can't try it right now. If you can tell me what the syntax is, I might be able to try it really quickly. Um, let's see. Uh, Tomas says, you can also use cat-s to squeeze the multiple empty lines in a single, single ones. Yeah, that's possible. I would prefer not to have to do any post-processing step to it. I, I would prefer if it would just write it out the right way to begin with. Uh, but the nice thing about this is that I can use the same exact org files to, um, let me jump back to that really quick. Projects, sites, site, content, geeks, introduction. I can use the same org file to generate the Gemini site as well as the, uh, the HTML website. And basically, they look the same aside from just, you know, whatever small differences there are in terms of uh, formatting and layout. So if I were to go 
to the page for introduction to GNU Geeks. And basically it's the same content. It's just the way that, uh, way that it's been rendered in the output format. So it's really cool to be able to have the ability to have those sites on both protocols and not just on, um, not just on the regular web. So if you wanted a way to contribute to Gemini, you know, to contribute to the ecosystem, basically, you could easily, if you have an, an org mode based site, or maybe even any other static site generator, it might be easy to plug in a Gemini backend. Uh, then you can generate, generate your same website to both protocols, basically. Let's see. Inline definition of the footnote. Yeah, let's, let's see really quickly if I can do that. FN colon colon. Uh, here's a test footnote. Ah, yeah, Tomas says uh, you can use cat s as a proof of concept implementation to see if it's enough to make your capsule look pretty. Uh, yeah, that's, that's definitely true. So let me try to, to generate this really quick and see if uh, if it if it does the right output. So Emacs dash Q batch uh, L publish fun call EW publish. I believe that's right. And we'll see really quickly whether this works or not. I'm glad you like the music, Elephant. I, I wonder if it's getting too repetitive. I would really like to make some new music for the, the background of the stream, but uh, uh, Linux audio programs sometimes are a pain to use, so I haven't had much luck le lately. Let's see. I'm going to go to the Gemini output folder. Crafter System with Geeks. Uh, introduction index.gmi. Okay, it looks like it did work here, because here's a footnote uh, for one. And if I search for one in the document then the footnote section does get generated so i think that um i think that this generator actually does respect footnotes correctly so that's pretty cool if you wanted to have footnotes in your uh your articles you could easily do that with uh with this however i don't know that i would use the hyphens at the end here i would just probably put it under a heading of its own uh, at the end of the document but that's just me i, I wonder if the let's see can i go back to that page yeah, let's see if he actually supports that in here. So footnote, don't export the footnote session, which will be handled at the end of the template. Okay, so maybe it's getting written out some other way because he doesn't actually explicitly support it. That's interesting. Well, at least we know it is possible. All right, so uh, the the last interesting thing about the what I did to set this up is that uh, I'm automatically publishing this to uh, to Source Hut anytime that I make a commit to my repo, and it's very similar to what I was already doing for this. So, um, if I if you go check out the build.yaml file, I'll look at it. Wow, why is it always pulling up the wrong path? Uh, projects site uh, sites site dot build dot yaml. So the things that I added here, uh, what I was doing before was uh, generating. I'm running my publish script and it generates a folder called public. I would go into the public folder and then zip up or tar GZ all of its contents up into a file and then upload that uh, using this line here. So since I'm now generating a Gemini folder, I do the same thing. I just go into that folder, pack up all the files, and then I do an additional call to this a curl command. Uh, the only difference is that I'm passing a different path for uh, Gemini.tar.gz and then I'm adding the protocol equals Gemini parameter to the request. So the, the endpoint for pages.sr.ht, um, it recognizes that parameter and then it knows that if you publish a tar GZ to that uh, protocol, then it's going to host it as a Gemini site. So you get Gemini hosting for free. You don't have to set up your own server. And if you're only using static files, it's a very easy way to go um, to, to make a website on Gemini. So I know that, uh, that Eric had to uh, host his own server somewhere on someone's computer to get a capsule online, uh, but this is another way to do it in case you don't need to have any kind of dynamic content. It's only static pages and you want to do it um, basically for free. Um, there's, I think there's also other uh, free uh, capsule hosting sites as well that you can use for, for doing that stuff. But the difference here is that uh, SourceHut will allow you to put your own custom domain. And that's how I can have my own systemcrafters.cc domain uh, be working on Gemini. So a uh, pretty cool thing to be able to do that. Uh, Garzola says, uh, what about putting the links into the footnotes? I mean, that is possible, but if you have a longer document like the ones that I do for all the show notes, I would prefer them to be in the section that 
I'm uh, I'm looking for. Uh, let's see. E. Um, YA snippet, the YAS snippet package, and I think LSP mode connects to that to do the parameter completion inside of functions. So that's basically it for what I wanted to say about Gemini today. If, if anybody else has any extra questions on that, please feel free to ask, and I'll try to check the uh, the chat to see if anybody asked anything else. Uh, Tomas says, let's see your literate Emacs config exported with that OX Gemini. Um, yeah, that might be horrifying, but uh, let's see. I would have to copy all over that uh, configuration. So publish.el. While people are getting their questions together, if you have any, I'll go do this really quickly. So in dot .files, I have the dot .site folder, publish.el. Jump down to the end here, paste this in. Um, let's see, config.dbl.com. And then up here, I need to pull in, oops, let's pull in uh, OX Gemini. And I also need to copy over that function that I use for customization. So DW org Gemini, let's just copy that really quickly and then drop it in right here. And that should be enough. So if I, Draw back to console, cd dot files dot site. Then I can run the same publish command again. And let's see if it works. We'll just take a look at the GMI file. I'm not going to try to publish it yet. Doesn't like something in there. Boy, that's taking a while. Okay, so we'll look at, uh, oh, interesting. Seems to have not worked for some reason, but I'm not gonna spend much more time on that because that was just sort of a one-off trial at getting it to work. You know, maybe, let me take this out. Uh, uh, Tomas asks, any mobile clients? I think there are, but I haven't tried any yet. I think they're basically just uh, simple, like, browser-based uh, clients that don't look very good. But yeah, I think they would be pretty easy to make one for mobile if you wanted to. All right. So, I think we'll move on to the next topic, since we are, you know, about uh, an hour and 15 minutes into everything. Uh, so today, I wanted to try something new that we haven't done before on this channel, but I've been thinking about doing for a while, and that's a, uh, a new series that I would like to call Dot File Detective. So basically, the, the idea is that we're going to take a look at other people's configurations and try to see if there's anything interesting we can learn from them, uh, and uh, maybe even try them out. I don't know if I'll be able to run this configuration, but we will see if, if it will work. But today, we're going to look at the configuration of, uh, of Angry Bacon, or uh, Matthew Mark, who is probably still here in the chat. I, th I saw him earlier there, so I think he's probably still here. But uh, we're going to use uh, Angry Bacon as the guinea pig for this whole experiment today. I've, I've talked to him about it before, so he knows it's going to happen. Uh, and we're going to just take a look at his Emacs configuration and uh, see what we can find out about, uh, about that. And I will try to run it. We'll see if it works. Uh, it, I may just like totally destroy the stream if I do that, but we'll find out. All right, so let me pull up that folder where I, I cloned his stuff. Okay, so if you want to see his configuration on GitHub, you can actually go to github.com slash angrybacon slash dot emacs. I can pull it up really quickly here, github.com slash angrybacon slash dot emacs. And uh, if you've spent any time on the uh, Discord, people have asked about uh, Angry Bacon's config a few times there. So that's another reason why I decided to pull his up first, because people have uh, have seen it before. And also, a lot of people have seen it on GitHub, apparently, because it has 235 stars. So that should tell you something. All right, so, so now that you're, you're finished washing dishes, we can talk about your configuration. All right, so first of all, I'm going to start at the... Uh, at the .emacs 
or a, the readme.org file, which is basically the entry point to his configuration, it seems. Um, so it's an org based configuration. As we can see, there's a few different uh, org files here, uh, like desktop.org, .emacs.org, and a couple of these are um, just uh, documentation, I think, copying a readme. So the uh, apparently he's using his uh, configuration on Arch Linux. I believe he was also using it quite a lot on Mac, Mac OS. So I think there's probably some stuff for that here as well. And uh, let's see, he mentions that it's automatically tangled from an org file into a Lisp file using uh, .emacs.org. Uh, a few dependencies are being mentioned here. And uh, one plug I will give for GNU Geeks is that you won't have to mention the dependencies because you'll put them in the document and then Geeks will install them for you. So that's kind of a nice thing. Um, all right, so yes, the different configurations he uses. Um, oh, he seems to have an arch.org file. Did I miss that? It's not here, so maybe maybe that was an old thing that's not here anymore. Uh, Mac OS uh, basically says he uses Mac Plus, uses Flycheck as a linter framework, and also you need to install some dependencies for that. <laughs> uh, Garjola says the what the dot el joke works in French. Yeah, I think it probably makes more sense in French than in, in English, but I, I totally get it though. Uh, yeah, Tomas says Tico source config is. Uh, uh, also an interesting fig. I, we will use that at some point. We'll have to look at it on the website, though, because it looks more amazing on the on the website. Um, icons, using all the icons. And then, oh, the dot repository. Okay, you, uh, Matthew has a separate repository for uh, configurations for other things. So I actually didn't know that. So we'll have to look at that, too. Uh, language servers, also, uh, I believe Matthew does a lot of TypeScript development. So he installs the TypeScript language server to use an LSP mode. So that's good to know. And that's basically, <clears throat> excuse me, basically it for the readme file. So let's go take a look really quickly at the .emacs file. And apparently there are file local variables in this file for display line numbers width. That's cool. So I'm going to press yes to accept that because I don't think it's going to destroy my system. And uh, this file is uh, how many lines? Whoa. So it's uh, about 3,000 lines almost. How long is mine? Mine is... Okay, mine's mine's long too, so I, I can't say anything about the length. Mine is four thousand four hundred and something. I, I need to clean mine up really badly. It's it's too too big. All right, so back to the dot emacs. So, um, one thing I did like about what I saw whenever I looked at Matthew's web uh, repository on uh, GitHub is that he has a lot of these uh, table sections at the beginning of a lot of his headings, where he's basically giving information. He has some inline like to do lists. Uh, which this sort of uh, this to do list syntax is interesting. I haven't actually seen this before very much. I know that it's possible, but I haven't really used it myself. Um, and I think if, if we go look at his web, his configuration on the website, does it actually show those up correctly? Like if I search for to do. Oh, wow. OK, that's pretty cool. So they show up as tables. These aren't I think they are highlighted a certain way, but it's hard to tell because the the dark theme. But um, yeah, so basically you have these nice little table sections and they kind of make this nice like outline box here. So that's the way to specify some metadata for your packages. So this is a, a pattern that I haven't seen very frequently, but it's kind of cool. Um, then let's see what else. So uh, let's look at the overall outline. Uh, the what is the file name of the tangled file? I would believe it would have to be uh, init.el. Let's just see, does init.el mention in here somewhere? It doesn't say. Oh, maybe it actually does go to .emacs. So that's a good point. So there's init.el, which I believe is is the output of, no, good, good to know. So init.el is, uh, I think this is being loaded dynamically at start. So let's see, he's pulling up his uh, org emacs file checking to see if the org file is newer than uh, init.el or .org .c.el okay so it's dot, dot, dot .emacs.el like written out as a word and uh, we don't see it here because it gets uh, generated whenever the whenever emacs starts up so i think that basically what he's doing is that on startup it's actually not a bad idea on startup he's looking to see if the org file is newer than the output file and if if it is or if maybe the the output file doesn't exist he generates the output file 
but every time he loads Emacs subsequently, it doesn't recompile it. So this is different than the model where you automatically load, uh, you, you tangle on load. Some people use this approach where you, they tangle on load, so they never have to worry about tangling to an output file. Uh, but the thing I don't like about that is that it slows your startup down because it's automatic. It's having to go and retangle your, your content every single time for your main configuration file. Uh, what Matthew's doing here is uh, tangling it only when necessary so that he can benefit from the uh, the tangled output to get that speed of it being automatically uh, it being pre-tangled basically but he doesn't have to tangle on save like I do with my configuration so I think this is a, is a nice way to do it to get sort of like the best of both worlds so you don't have to worry about tangling the file or checking the file in you just basically uh, let it be tangled on the first load uh, and then garbage collecting after tangling, which is probably a good idea. Um, also, I noticed there's an early init file. So let me just see if there's anything else interesting here. So the GC cons percentage, basically tweaking the GC parameters. Uh, one thing that he's doing here is doing this inside of a let block, uh, which is great because it sets these variables uh, temporarily during startup. Uh, mainly, I think it's because he's using lexical binding T here. So. In the let block, we are setting these parameters temporarily, and then uh, uh, then as soon as this let block is finished, those variables go back to the original values. So it goes back to the to the Emacs defaults. So this is a nice way to do this startup. I don't think I've seen this pattern used very frequently, um, but I like it a lot because it um, it enables him to control that without having put all that stuff inside of his uh, org file. In my org file, I do have all this sort of GC manipulation stuff sort of wrapping the whole file. Uh, I might actually change mine to, to be more like this because I think this is a better approach. So instead of doing what I'm currently doing where I write out init.el directly from my org file, I would write out a separate file like maybe let's say emacs-config.el and then have a handwritten init.el much like this one that uh, does the process of sort of initiating that load of that file and changing the GC parameters. Um, also, he's setting the default directory to the user Emacs directory, which is interesting. I think probably that helps with just, you know, the first place that you, that find file puts you whenever you try to open a file. Um, also, uh, here is a, another little performance boost that you can do for startup, which is basically clearing the file name handler A list. So whenever you are, whenever org tangle is operating and whenever other packages are loading, clearing this list uh, cuts out a lot of uh, checks that are being done when a file gets loaded because it's basically checking all these handlers to see what functions handle what types of files. If you clear, clear this list out, it skips all that. So um, I also think this read process output max is probably another little performance tweak that uh, makes it so that writing files out um, is faster. So if I were to look at the documentation for this um, variable, maximum number of bytes to, to read from subprocess in a single chunk. Um, I wonder which, uh, Matthew, what actually benefits from this in the end? This is for reading from a process. So which process is getting read on startup that this actually benefits from? Kind of curious about that. Um, so also there's an echo area message for startup. Uh, the info disclaimer in the messages buffer. Yeah, I, I barely even pay attention to that, so I never see it. And then after save hook... Um, oh, okay. So he's, he is tangling on save, it seems. After save hook. Interesting. A oh, huge A-list from desktop. D okay, that actually makes sense. That uh, makes a lot of sense. So uh, one thing I do know is that Matthew likes to use desktop D desktop.el, which is a built-in um, feature inside of Emacs that allows you to save sessions um, whenever you have like certain window configurations or buffer lists open and uh, it will save that whenever you exit Emacs so that you can pull those same sessions back up again later. So apparently reading those in can be pretty taxing because those files might be large if they have a lot of information in them. So if you change this read process output max, it might actually make it faster because it's, it increases the size of the chunks from which it's going to read those files. Uh, so that makes sense. So yeah, there's a lot of very, very bespoke uh, performance work being done here, and I, I like it a lot. I think it's very, very good. Uh, there's also this early init.el file that we should look at. So early init is a newer thing. I think maybe it started in Emacs 27. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. 
Uh, and it, this gets, oh yeah, here we go. Since Emacs 27, an early configuration file can be provided to handle initialization to be d done before init.el is loaded. Um, so these are things that are being set early so that um, they can configure any kind of behavior that's needed. Um, Matthew says that the first save variable, safe variable is for when I use tangle on save for the smaller org files, those in the dot repository. So he has other org files that need to be tangled on save. So he's basically setting that variable up to do that uh, for those files, which does make sense. All right. So uh, load prefer newer T. So I think this is for loading Emacs Lisp files. Um, let me actually double check that. Could it be for anything? Load prefer. Why didn't I go there? prefers the newest version of a file. I guess it's for any file. So stops the first file that exists unless you specify one or the other. Okay. I, I yeah, okay. I think that is basically for um, Emacs Lisp files that have been uh, byte compiled to uh, to be for, for performance. So whenever you use packages from like package.el, etc., it installs all the package code locally and then it will byte compile to an ELC file. Uh, so I think what, what this does basically is uh, you have the, let's say, um, Gemini.el and Gemini.elc next to each other. What Emacs will do is uh, by default, it will pick the ELC file first because it's the compiled file. But if you set this load prefer newer to true, it will always pick whatever the newer file is for either of those. Like let's say for instance, you edited one of those EL files. You wanna make sure that the newer one gets loaded and not the old file. So it might cause you to get uh, old behavior to get pulled up sometimes when you don't expect it. So this basically just avoids that problem. Um, so then we have a package enable at startup, which is uh, make install packages available when Emacs starts. Yeah, is that that's nil by default. That's interesting. So this basically tells you, you have to set it in early init. And what does this do? Like preload everything? Cause I mean, they get loaded anyway. So it's kind of interesting that it doesn't, uh, that it needs a variable for this. Uh, package native compile. It looks like he's using the native compile branch of Emacs and uh, basically tells package.el to natively compile any packages that get installed and loaded. Um, also uh, setting the default frame A list. It sounds like this would be, well, uh, maybe he's using daemon, uh, uh, the Emacs daemon, because you kind of need to do this for the Emacs daemon, I think, to set the default default frame parameters. But it could just be used for just the setting um, Emacs to load a certain way at startup so that you don't see like a flash of color or flash of UI uh, that doesn't look good um, at, at early startup. So I know that, uh, that Matthew uses EXWM, so this is probably for that, actually, where... In early init, you set these parameters here. So basically you're saying full screen the window as soon as it loads, uh, turn off the, the scroll bars, set the fringe a certain way. Yeah, he says it's here to avoid flickering. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, and turn off the toolbar and turn off the vertical scroll bar. So basically just turn off all the UI elements at first so that uh, uh, EXWM pops up and it's a, a, effectively a blank screen. Uh, d does your screen flash white whenever you start up immediately? We could, you could probably set the, the font face here as well. Or, hmm, I think you can set faces in default frame A list. Maybe you could do that too. But uh, that, that is one thing about EXWM is like when it first starts up, you're going to see like a flash of EXWM looking a certain way that doesn't look like your final Emacs configuration would. So yeah, that's that's early in that .el. That's pretty simple, straightforward. Um, but yeah, I mean, even just looking at those files, there's a lot of cool stuff to learn from that. And I'm, I'm definitely going to steal your config. And, uh, you know, thankfully, uh, Matthew use, uses the uh, do whatever the F you want to public license. So I can take it without having to uh, to attribute him. So that's great. Everybody's going to think that I came up with this myself and they're going to give me all the credit. So I feel really good about that. All right. So let's see. Um, let's go back to .emacs.org. And uh, there's some high level um, sections here. There's bootstrap, there's languages, and there's features. So in the bootstrap section, it seems that this is all about um, configuring the basics of Emacs to be the way that he wants. So like uh, setting up uh, package.el and use package for installing packages and, and managing them, et cetera. Um, 
better defaults. So there's a lot of uh, variables being set here and he's using set queue default to make sure that that's the default value going forward for all those variables. Because if you just set them globally, they may be something different whenever you go into an actual uh, buffer. Um, and he helpfully also has documentation for all these things to say why he's setting them, which is good because, you know, if you're looking at these, like, let's say, uh, delete selection mode one, you don't really know what that means. So you can take a look at, um, this, this here basically saying replace region when inserting text. So I think basically that's, uh, if you insert text, it will just, uh, delete that current region when, it, uh, whatever's selected. <laughs> Matthew says that we will blame you for bugs too. That sounds good. It's fine. Uh, let's see what else is interesting in here. He does tweak the GC cons threshold. Um, what else? Uh, delete by moving to trash. Uh, I highly recommend people go and um, turn this on because two days ago I in Dear Red accidentally deleted a folder that I didn't want to delete. Um, thankfully, nothing very important was in there, but I did delete it, and I wish I had this turn on at the time because then I would have had those files in the trash. So, go turn this on if you want to save your sanity. Uh, or back up your system, which is another thing I don't do. I like to live on the edge. All right, cursor in non-selected windows. Hide the cursor in inactive windows. That sounds like a good idea because, oh wait, he actually wants it to, no. Let's, oh, he's hiding it, yeah, okay. You set it to nil to um, to do that. So let me actually split these windows really quickly. And uh, if I put the cursor here, and that, yeah, so you'll see that there's this sort of ghost cursor right there, which might be visually distracting, I suppose, uh, depending on your your, your uh, theme and whatnot. So uh, that's a thing that you should think about if you don't want to see that cursor there. Custom unlistify menu entries. Prefer kebab case for titles. Yeah, there's there's some, some deep tweaks in here that I've never seen before. So that's kind of cool. Um... We'll have to load up this config if we can do it in the amount of time left and see what this stuff looks like because uh, there's some of these things I've never seen before. Select enable clipboard, merge system and Emacs clipboard. That sounds pretty useful actually. Uh, it seems to be set true by default and he is setting it to true. So maybe it's good to just be explicit about that depending on what version of Emacs you're using. <clears throat> uh, what else? Global subword mode, iterate through camel case words. Yeah, there's a lot of config here. We're not going to step through everything because there's plenty of more things to look at here. So um, definitely go through and comb through his list of variables that he's setting for his defaults here. Um, because, uh, you know, you might find some some very uh, nice little gems here, like saying we're not using Game Boys anymore. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I think that the default const, the GC threshold is a little bit ridiculous as a default. So uh, tweaking it a bit probably is a good idea. <clears throat> All right, so setting the cache directory, um, that is something you definitely wanna do uh, to avoid having Emacs write a bunch of crap in your Emacs, uh, Emacs D folder. Uh, Matthew says, a few of these could probably be removed at Emacs default change. Um, you started with Emacs 22, that's, that's a long time ago. Yeah, or you know, there's we could make a community package containing some of these that people could benefit from because I don't know that, that many of the defaults are going to change. They, they, they're pretty reticent to change any of the defaults in Emacs I've seen. Um, all right, let's see what else we got here. Setting some specific directories here. Tramp persistency file name, which makes sense. Um, <clears throat> it seems like you may not be using node littering. So some of this could go away if you use node littering, um, which I find to be pretty useful for that purpose because I don't like having to go track down all the things I don't want to show up in my Emacs.d folder. Um, doing some special case behavior for the Windows system uh, on, um, excuse me, Mac OS, he is maximizing the window and on, uh, on Windows, he seems to be full screening the window, I think. I'm not exactly sure what the full both does compared to that, compared to maximized. Um, indentation behaviors, Put add function, okay, yeah. So Lisp, indent Lisp indentation, he's changing that for certain functions. So this actually is a thing that you can use to change how uh, Emacs does Lisp indentation. Uh, sometimes the way that it indents Lisp is a little bit weird. And if you want to change that, you can go and use this put function and say for a, a certain part of your Lisp code, uh, say what the indentation should be. So probably add function is like, indentation of one or something here. So he changed it to two, which I think it makes sense. Uh, oh yeah, garbage collect on focus out. Um, yeah, this one, 
maybe it works well because if you garbage collect frequently enough, maybe it doesn't get backed up and, and slow things down. But I kind of feel like if you did that, it would have some hiccups. But maybe it's good. I don't know. All right. What else? <laughs> okay. So as I mentioned, uh, Matthew started using EXWM fairly recently, uh, but I think he's probably got a pretty good configuration on that so far. Um, so when no Emacs, when it, when no window manager is detected, Emacs will act as one. Uh, so basically, using super as the prefix for a lot of the special keys. So basically, like you know, um, screenshots with uh, super S. Uh, re resetting the window state with uh, super R, super one, super two, or workspace switching commands. It's I think that what I, I heard from Matthew in the Discord is that he has one workspace per screen, one EXWM workspace per screen. And what this does is gives you the ability to easily switch your focus between the two screens. And then I think he uses something else to do individual workspaces on those screens that isn't specific to EXWM. Checking my phone in case anybody's yelling at me. All good. So, what else? Uh, so a couple of simulation keys, which makes sense. Basically, remapping Emacs normal uh, copy and paste keys to Control V, Control C. Uh, that's something I don't do at all, but I, I should do that because I think there's a few things I probably want to to uh, to do. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Peter says I'm new to Emacs, and before the stream, I was watching the Learn Elisp series. Would it make sense to convert that big set Q default block to customize set variable instead? Um. Well, some of them may not be customization variables, uh, but yeah, some of it could be done that way. But I think set Q default would work fine. It's just if you try to set a variable that's a custom variable using uh, set Q, you might skip some of that uh, um, setting logic that's been attached to the custom variable. So it can be dangerous sometimes, but I think a lot of these variables are all meant to be set normally. So I don't think that you're going to have a problem setting these in this way. All right, let's see what else we got. Um, setting up EXWM X render. So, you know, running X render to set the, the window configuration, which makes a lot of sense. Um, the normal, typical rename buffer commands, um, uh, running a shell command asynchronously, which is pretty useful. Uh, there's a secrets.el file to keep, um, secrets out of version control. So like any kind of, uh, passwords probably, or tokens and any personal information like your username and email address. So, uh, it looks like. He's defining these variables up front, and then he's loading in overrides for them from his secret.el file. And as you can see, I bet he doesn't check that in, so it's not here. So uh, what it would be nice to know is, like, how are you syncing that between your computers? Are you just copying it manually? Uh, theme uses ZenMelt. I actually haven't heard of that one, so let's check that out. Emacs ZenMelt theme. No. Is it your own theme? Is that what happened? Because I see your dot emacs here basically at the top. So, wow. Okay. So, the internet is not uh, giving it to me. Let me actually check and see. Oh, he's got it in a directory here. So, basically, it's in his Lisp folder. So, let me jump to that really quickly. So, Lisp slash Zen Melt. Uh, and for whatever reason, it's not here, but it must be getting tangled out from a dot file. So, if we were to look for a Zen Melt, yeah, I, I figured that out <clears throat> later. Okay, so Zen Melt here, a Lisp slash Zen Melt. Okay. It's interesting though that it's not actually showing up in your directory. Oh, it's a, it's a Git submodule. Now I understand what you're saying. Okay, so basically he's got some submodules to this repo, which I didn't know about when I cloned it. Um, hmm. Interesting. I don't know. If, is there a way to easily clone the submodules without like deleting the repo and starting over? I can't remember. I don't like submodules, so I try to use them as rarely as possible. Let's see, dot emacs. Okay, so um, I'll consult the internet. Git uh, pull sub modules after clone. I won't spend much time on this. Uh, git sub module update dash dash init. Git, git sub module update dash dash init. Okay. Yeah, Peter, thanks. Cool, this seems to be working. I think some of these things are coming from uh, Matthew's own repos. So if I were to refresh, go into this. Okay, so Zen Melt. And then we go into Zen Melt theme. 
So we can kind of see all the colors here thanks to, what is it, rainbow something? Rainbow, rainbow mode, yeah. So yeah, just a basically a fully custom theme, which is kind of cool. Hey, Florian, nice to see you here. I, I love Cute Browser, it's great. I've been using Cute Browser for probably two, maybe three years. I, I had a, a brief moment where I went to VimB because uh, they didn't have the newer Cute Browser with Qt Web Engine on Geeks yet, on GNU Geeks. So I had to go, well, I can't remember. I think I think that Cute Browser, Cute Browser wasn't working for a little while in Geeks, so I had to use VimB for a while, but then I came back to Cute Browser because VimB is limited in a lot of ways. All right, so um, let's see. Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely a world of gratitude to you because that's a, it is a great browser. I like it a lot. So let's see, what else we got here? Uh, Ahmed says, what extension do you have for colors? You mean showing up the colors in the theme in line? That is uh, the rainbow mode extension. All right, so let's go back to .emacs.org. Don't want to spend too much more time because we're getting like 20 minutes to the end of the stream. So let's, let's see if we can catch all the cool stuff. So he has some helpers for switching themes, which makes sense. Uh, setting it up with a Hydra. Where is that defined? Maybe I'm wrong about that. Okay, so let's let's go back up to the the root again. So that seems to be like it for the basics. Like he's setting the theme, he's setting his defaults, uh, setting up EXWM. I know he has some other Lisp modules that we'll check out in a bit. The next part is basically a uh, a section where he's configuring all of his different language modes that he uses. So he's uh, seems to be primarily using. Uh, JavaScript, HTML, CSS, etc. So there's some different modes for those here and some configuration setting like, you know, indentation widths and whatnot, uh, turning on certain uh, modes. I didn't know about this SGML mode. Let's see, SGML mode Emacs. So uh, an Emacs mode for SGML files. That, oh, maybe it's actually built in now, or maybe it was always built in. Anyway, I'm not going to sit there and read that documentation. Kateru says, is there a way how to save history after restarting the browser? Yeah. Um, let's see. What else? JavaScript. Should be some straightforward stuff there. We're using JS2 mode, which I agree. Uh, RJSX mode for doing ReactJS. Uh, web mode for editing uh, TypeScript and TSX files. That's interesting. You must be using TypeScript for React. Um, I, I use this a bit too, but some of it sometimes it doesn't work so great. But you know, that's the way it goes. Web development in Emacs can be kind of not not as not so good sometimes. Uh, JSON mode. Uh, okay, we got some Lisp configuration here. Elisp mode. Um, some custom commands for evaluation of code. That's pretty useful, I would say. I might steal that. Um, also, turning on outline minor mode. That's nice. Um, do I have that installed? That's actually part of Emacs. Okay, so basically being able to turn your Emacs file into an outline file probably matters whenever you have um, some of these Lisp files. Let's see what about locust.el. I would imagine, okay, that one's not big enough to actually see anything. MTG. Yeah, so I think that these sections here probably are getting outlined. Let's turn it on, uh, outline minor mode. So I can use these same uh, shift tab and tab bindings to, well, is it just shift tab? Okay, maybe it's just shift tab to basically collapse and expand these sections. So I think that's what he's doing there. It's basically making it so that you can um, hide parts of the buffer whenever you're looking at it. Let's see. Um, oh, SGML is a thing that defines HTML mode. Interesting, okay. Uh, also, the interactive uh, Emacs Lisp uh, REPL, basically, uh, that's set here. He sets the scroll margin to zero. I haven't seen that done before. That's interesting. Lisp data mode for ELD files. What is that? Lisp data mode. It is a major mode for buffer buffers holding data written in Lisp syntax. I guess it basically just turns off certain bindings for like evaluation that you don't need for that. Markdown. Hopefully you don't have to edit that too much, probably just for like, you know, source code repositories. Um, not too much there. Uh, org mode configuration, that's probably gonna be fairly big. Oh, not, not too big, mine is huge, so. Uh, let's see. 
So basically some, some basic customization. So we are using custom here in the use package to customize these variables, which makes sense. Uh, some basic configuration here as well. Setting up evil mode bindings for um, moving between headings, which is cool. He has some custom functions for cycling parents and for showing headings, uh, which definitely can be useful. I kind of do some of that in my um, org present configuration. And then for editing YAML files, yeah, just YAML mode. There's really nothing special you can do there. There, there there's a mode called origami mode that I was using for editing YAML files and like um, uh, collapsing sections, but the size of the YAML files I was editing, it was just, it was making Emacs cry. So I haven't tried it since I used em the native comp branch, so maybe that would help a lot. Uh, check out what I put on uh, control J and control K. Yeah, basically these functions of showing the next heading. So there's there's some stuff here that's pretty interesting. Um, first of all, sa <clears throat> excuse me, saving excursion, um, going to the end of line and then checking if the outline is invisible. So basically seeing if it's visible currently. Um, okay, then you're calling prog in to show the entry and then show the children. And then the next heading, uh, if it's if it's if it's visible, then you go to the next heading, and then you B O L P is that beginning of line? Yeah, it's basically it sees at the point is the beginning of the line. Uh, or get heading P overview reveal show entry. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff here basically. Ah, yeah, that's a good point. So um, let me just evaluate this, which is kind of cool. I can just pull up his config and evaluate it. So I'm going to go to one of these. Let's just uh, hide everything. And let's say me slash show next heading tidally. So let me press enter. And it basically just opens it up. And then if I'm in here, I can press the same thing again. And then I think it goes to the next heading, basically. Oh, okay, that's cool. So basically it... Uh, if you're navigating through this document with control J, control K, then it progressively, <clears throat> excuse me, progressively opens every section and then closes everything else is what it sounds like. So that could be helpful for uh, navigating through this document without seeing all of the stuff open at the same time. All right, what else? Let me, let me, let me just go in and close it again so I can just see the, the high level stuff again. Okay, so features. This is actually the, the interesting part because we get into the real meat of the configuration sounds like he uses hydra quite a lot for <coughs> excuse me for key bindings for certain things basically uh transient key maps so like setting dates or maybe getting dates um controlling applications and this is something that i use uh uh key prefixes in which key for but you can also use hydra for it pretty easily as well Uh, markdown files, uh, certain editing things for markdown files, uh, projectile functions. That's pretty useful. It, that, this might be pretty useful in general, like a lot of different functions for a projectile here. Uh, Hydra is something I haven't really spent a lot of time on myself, aside from making a really ugly Hydra for uh, resizing windows, which I'm not going to show you right now because it's just uh, horrifying. Um, what else? UI. So let's see. Changing the theme, uh, text increase, decrease. Yeah, that's pretty useful. Balancing windows, uh, maximizing the frame, toggling line numbers. So yeah, a lot of good Hydras here that somebody can learn from if you wanted to learn more about how to use uh, Hydra. Also eyebrows and being able to do certain things with that. I guess the benefit here is that you can make a nicer interface for um, setting up bindings that have stuff under them. Uh, transient, yeah, could, yeah, Ramsey says uh, there's also the transient package that you could use for this as well. I think Hydra might be a little bit easier to configure, but I haven't looked at using transient for the same kind of thing before. LSP mode config, uh, seems like he's actually using uh, Eglot now, um, which, you know, not a, not a bad thing there because Eglot's pretty good. Um, let's see what else. Line number configuration, linters. What is something useful, like super useful, that we could see here? Um, hey, thanks, D3 Fragged. OS specific stuff. Uh, it might be useful if you if you use Emacs on multiple operating systems. It might be useful to go look at this section to see what he does for that. Um, some stuff for Mac OS and Windows specifically. Yeah, this is pretty useful on Windows. Basically, um, is this the bash that comes from WSL? 
yeah, developer mode. So you could tell uh, the shell mode in Emacs to run bash.exe. I usually just use eShell inside of Windows, but one benefit of using bash or some other shell in Windows instead is that Emacs file access tends to be pretty slow in Windows. So if you use a different external shell in shell mode, it might be, might be faster for shelling in Emacs in Windows. Uh, parenthesis management with smart parens. Um, I haven't really used smart parens very much, but I think that's a, a good idea for sure. Let's see what else. Uh, point and region selected. Point. Oh, right here, right here. Underrated package, he says. Selected IEL. Enable new custom binds when a region is active. That's actually a good idea. I haven't uh, haven't thought of that or haven't tried to use that, but basically when you select a region, you can set special key bindings that are only active when that region, when a region is selected. So um, it looks like like translating a word or pretty printing some uh, structure, indentation, highlighting, up casing, down casing, um, and then marking certain sections. So basically increasing or decreasing the size of the, uh, of the marked region. So yeah, that could be pretty useful. I, I might have to go back and review that one and see what kind of stuff is in there. Uh, quality of life, um, a lot of stuff about code indentation, which key, uh, date and time functions, highlighting the current line. What is simple? Oh, okay. Is simple like a built-in package? Let's see. Which key? Uh, okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Matthew says that uh, pretty print is actually set depending on the current major mode. Let's see, uh, me slash pretty print. Ah, I think I just saw that. Yeah, so basically on HTML mode, he has a lambda bound to the uh, HTML mode hook that sets the pretty print function to be SGML pretty print. That's cool. So uh, is that just like for formatting the uh, the selection basically using a pretty print function? All right, let's see what else. Terminal, let's see what kind of terminal stuff does he, does he use? Uh, using vterm, I think that uh, you had some trouble with vterm recently, didn't you? Or maybe I'm thinking of someone else in the Discord. Uh, version control, obviously we're going to be using uh, Magit here at some point, but he also uses git commit for auto-filling commit messages. Hmm. Oh, okay, that's basically wrapping the lines, I think. Okay, yeah, inserting new line and filling, that makes sense. What else? Let's see. Uh, pen entry, yep, definitely want that if you want to uh, authenticate against your Git repo inside of Emacs without having to have, like, you know, some GNOME w window pop up and ask you for it. Oh, yeah, he's also got his um, GNU PG uh, config being written out from here, which is interesting. I don't actually see you setting the tangle paths for these, so how are these getting written out to the right path? Are you doing some magic using the, um, the heading here? Because that would be awesome. So where would that be? Let's see, tangle. Let's use a uh, swiper, tangle. So it's not here. What about inside of the list folder? I don't know, I don't know what any of this stuff is. So let me search the repo, oh. Rip grep is complaining. That's great, council AG, tangle. Come on, man. Tangle. All right. Oh, you know why? It's because I'm not in the right repo. Let me go down here. Council AG Tangle. All right, cool. OB Tangle. Oh, cool. So you got an after save hook here that sets that variable. That's cool. Uh, okay, those aren't tangled, but it should be in the dot repository. Okay, that makes sense. So basically, he's got some. Um, some configuration snippets there that are for his reference, but they're not being written out to the actual files on the file system. Okay, so go back to .emacs.org. And let's check some more stuff here. White spaces, controlling white space. Uh, yeah, so there's like some white space stuff you can do for ripping stuff off. Is this, oh yeah, this is insured nil, so it must be part of Emacs. So I use something different for that. I think it's white space buff, bu butler. White space but butler. Jeez, I can't say it. Um, 
So I think I used to use white space mode, but I had trouble with it just like editing white space all over the file. But it sounds like maybe you have it have it set up here so that it does only on the current line, maybe unless I'm mistaken on that. Uh, Caterer says, could you link the doc files in the description? Yes, I should definitely do that. I also try to put the uh, show notes up afterwards as well so that you can see that stuff there. Uh, and then uh, he's using eyebrows for workspaces, which is a, a good package. It's made by uh, Wasamasa. And uh, basically, it's a simpler workspace package where you just have numbered workspaces that you can switch between, and they all have their own window configurations. I believe, though, that uh, he might be using, that, uh, that Matthew might be using um, desktop.el to save these workspace configurations or the window configurations in these workspaces whenever he exits. Um, Emacs, so that's actually kind of useful. Let's see if we can find that really quickly. Desktop.el. Use package desktop. All right, so after init, for desktop.el, after init, he's using desktop read and then desktop save mode to automatically save, I would guess. If we look at desktop save mode, we're, we're toggling it, basically turning it on, um, saying what the base file name would be. He's putting it into his uh, .cache folder, probably .cache slash Emacs. Uh, the lock file as well. Um, restore eager. What does that do? That is the number of buffers to restore immediately. So everything else is restored lazily. That's cool. Oh, it does. So basically, it loads these buffers automatically at startup, and then the rest it will load in the idle time of Emacs after startup is complete. Uh, also, not restoring frames, which is probably important with EXWM because then it might like try to screw with your uh, frame setup, and then EXWM won't like that. So uh, that's that's a smart thing to do. Oh, wow. Okay, we're almost at two hours now. Let's just try if I could see if I can load this up really quickly. So um, what I'm going to do is remove. Uh, no, not RMRF. Let me just RM my .emacs.d folder. And let's see. Let's see if I have any really bad results from doing this. Uh, LN -S -S -F, uh detective um, angry bacon .emacs to .emacs.d. Uh, lsal.emacs.d. Okay, so that's set up now. So I'm going to run, um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm just going to try to run Emacs here and see what happens. So it's it's full screening itself. And uh, I can see my, I'm sorry for the, the whiteness here. This is very blinding. But this is basically the kind of thing we're talking about. Let me jump back for a second, if it will let me. Okay, that might have been a terrible idea. <laughs> okay, so basically, uh, uh, thanks for joining, Florian. Very, very cool to have you here for for just a moment. Oh, working on support for libnotify notifications in cute, cute browser using Emacs. That's great. I would love to have that. Yeah, uh, Jerry, I think you did did just uh, get that tan that you wanted because uh, I think I also got blinded. But uh, maybe we can try that another time to start up the configuration because I didn't try that at all. And uh, obviously that was, um, it's going to take a while for Emacs native comp to compile all the packages and install everything. So it's just not a good idea. I should have probably set that up beforehand, but I didn't have time this morning because I have to chase a kid around and get her to go to school. So uh, let's see, let me, let me fix my Emacs config so that it uh, doesn't boot uh, Matthew's config the next time I start up Emacs. Oops. No, no, no. Let's go here. Yeah. Oh. Remove uh, .emacs.d. And then I'll go into my dot .files folder, stow. Dot. Okay. So I think that mine's back now. Okay, cool. Anyway, I think, yes, excuses. I know, I know. I, I literally came to, to sit down to do this before uh, the stream started, and I didn't have time to finish, so... Maybe next week I will make up for it by trying to show it really quickly because probably we won't do another dot file detective next week. But uh, that was fun though. Uh, hopefully people picked up a couple cool tips from looking over uh, Angry Bacon's configuration here. Um, I think that if I understood correctly, he's also got um, another repository called dot. Is that what it's called? Uh github.com slash angry bacon slash dot cool okay so there there is a a repo called dot that does have other org files here for configuring his systems there's some uh, arch linux configuration here um, probably some of this stuff is being written out to various files on the system 
So um, yeah, definitely check out those two repos. I will put those in the description so that you can find them easily. I'll also have them in the show notes after the stream is over and I get a chance to put those up. Uh, but yeah, thank you uh, to Matthew, aka Angry Bacon, for allowing me to demonstrate or at least show your configuration on stream. Obviously, you didn't have much to worry about because you have a very clean and well-organized configuration, more clean and organized than mine. So uh, uh, it, was, uh, it was a good starting point for this. I would like to find someone's configuration who um, maybe doesn't feel like theirs is so clean, and we could maybe talk about some improvements they can make to it at some point later. But maybe we'll find some good uh, ones to look at first to have you know some good patterns that people can learn from in the beginning, and then later we can go into looking at other people's configs to, to see if we can help polish them up um uh garjola says uh, if you do the detective on prots config it will take three full streams yeah it might i wouldn't go through his whole configuration i've only looked at it very briefly so i don't really know exactly what kind of stuff he has there um uh louis says uh don't you don't use the go binding on cute browser to edit the current url see that's the thing is i, f I forget about it so g what is it uh oh yeah I always forget. The problem is I use VimB for like maybe nine months and I got so used to the E key binding in VimB that I forgot how to do it in, in Cute Browser and then it totally screwed up my brain. So uh, yeah, yeah. So that's that's what I should have done. And you, you can't really read the text on this screen here because the I haven't fixed this, the size of the status bar in Cute Browser on this, this monitor. So it's extremely tiny. All right, so We've been here for two hours. I think I've taken up enough of your time today. So I appreciate you all coming today to to listen to uh, to me talk about Jim and I, and also to check out Angry Bacon's config. Um, uh, Juan Adrian Castro uh, Quintana says you should check out uh, Nixt browser written in Common Lisp and Vert. Uh, I do want to do a video or a stream on Nixt at some point, but uh, I haven't used it enough recently to. Uh, to show it off effectively. I, I did use it for maybe a month or so a while back, maybe a year and a half ago, and it was cool, but it it didn't work very well for me, but I'm hoping it will because I would really love to have a browser I can configure with Lisp. All right, before we head out, I just want to say thank you to my sponsors. Uh, these people have been so kind to sponsor the work I'm doing on making these videos and doing these live streams, etc. And uh, I'm very thankful to, uh, to them for their support. It definitely keeps me going whenever things are hard. And, you know, it's, it's difficult making videos every week whenever you get a full time job and everything. So uh, having people who are supporting me definitely gives me that extra motivation to um, to to keep going because they actually, you know, they, they feel like they're getting enough value from it to support me. So it, it makes it really meaningful for me and, and really motivating, basically. So if you are interested in becoming a sponsor of the channel, definitely check out the links below in the description. I'm on both GitHub sponsors and Patreon. I also have a link to PayPal for one-time tips if you want to do that. Uh, but if you don't want to support financially, uh, which is totally fine, you should just uh, like the videos and maybe just share them with people that you know. Like if you know people that are interested in, in computers and you know editors and stuff, just share my videos with them so that they can find them and you know maybe we can grow this community even more. So uh, until next time, uh, thanks for being here. I think um, on Monday, I'm going to do another video in the Emacs Essentials series, uh, I think covering the basic Emacs editing key bindings. So that should be very useful to you, those of you who don't know all of those, or maybe you use evil mode and you don't know what the default bindings are for Emacs. So uh, we're all going to learn something there. And then um, then next week, I don't really know what we'll do on the stream yet, but I'll figure something out. If you have any suggestions for things we can talk about in the stream next Friday, please feel free to leave them in the comments or just tell me on Discord or whatever. Uh, I should mention the link to the Discord is in the description below uh, and also in the live chat here if you see that. Um, someone, someone had trouble finding it earlier today, so I just wanted to point that out. All right, thanks to, so much for all of you who have been here today. I really appreciate you for being here. And until next time, happy hacking. See ya.